It's a weird time in American politics for many reasons, including but not limited to the increasing polarization of the two main parties, the difficulty in finding bipartisan opportunities to work together, the concomitant tendency for Congress and lawmakers at other levels of governance to not get much done, and the heightening tension between federal and state-level governments on an array of hot-button issues. But one of the most bizarre ongoing narratives within this larger, stasis-inducing state of affairs is the tale of former President Donald Trump and the legal woes he has faced since losing the 2020 election to now President Biden. Trump has denied, and continues to deny, the outcome of that election, attributing his loss to all sorts of things like corruption and fraud on the part of his political enemies, and in part because of things he's done in support of those, at this point, evidenceless allegations. A portfolio of legal intrigue has haunted him, even throughout his time in office, but especially since he left office in January of 2021. Now, a lot of print and digital ink has been spilled on this subject of late because of the outcome of one of the legal cases in which Trump has been enmeshed. He was found guilty in New York on 34 counts of falsifying business records in order to cover up a payment he made to an adult film star allegedly to keep her quiet about an affair that they had back in the day. And that is the main topic I'd like to delve into on this episode, as the implications of that juried court ruling are many and varied. But to kick things off, I think it's worth taking a look at the state of those other ongoing cases, as while they are less immediately relevant to Trump and his ambitions to retake the White House in November's election, they are still pursuing him in a way, serving as unknown variables that could pop up to bite him at some future moment, which is important when we're talking about someone who wants to become the most powerful person on the planet once more. One such case is focused on Trump's handling of classified documents when he left the White House, the allegations being that he took classified documents that he was not supposed to take, handled them in such a way that they were stored in public where anyone could steal or read them, and that he may have even shown them to other people on purpose, which is a big no-no. He also allegedly went out of his way to keep government agents from reclaiming those documents after he was asked to return them. This is considered to be kind of a big deal in part because there were hundreds of these sorts of documents that Trump seemed to treat as if they belonged to him, and which he then allegedly conspired with folks in his employ to hide from the agency responsible for keeping these sorts of things safe and hidden, which they do because these types of documents often contain information about U.S. military and intelligence matters. So that information, getting out, could conceivably put such assets, including people and infrastructure, at risk. Trump was indicted on this matter in mid-2023, and charged with 37 felony counts, then another three were added the same year, bringing the total up to 40. Trump pleaded not guilty to all of these charges, and his legal team has done all they can to slow walk the proceedings, which seems to have worked, as the case is now delayed indefinitely. The judge overseeing it, who was appointed to her position by Trump while he was in office, having been accused of slow walking the process on purpose, though that's not really something that can be proven, and there's a chance that the case is just complex enough as a fairly green judge attempting to tackle a big, important, complex case, she simply fell behind, and that stumbling is now in the spotlight and being reframed by folks who want to see this thing move forward faster. Trump also faces a case in Georgia that focuses on his alleged efforts to interfere with the 2020 presidential election, which again, he lost to Biden, but which he claims he won. He also claims he was the victim of some sort of conspiracy, the nature of that supposed conspiracy having changed several times in his telling since he initially made that claim. Trump and 18 of his allies were indicted in August of 2023 for these efforts, which have been framed as an attempt to subvert election results in the state of Georgia, and similar delay tactics have been used in this case as in the other ones, though the district attorney in charge of the case has made those efforts somewhat easier for them, having engaged in a relationship with the lead prosecutor who she hired which is arguably not relevant to the case at all, but it's also a fairly overt conflict of interest. The timeline of this case has thus been pushed back, and an appeals court in the state is reviewing a ruling that allowed the DA to remain on the case despite that apparent conflict of interest. This case was meant to go to trial beginning on August 5th, but that timing is now in serious question, and during all this deliberation, several counts against Trump have been dismissed. 
and he has pleaded not guilty to all of them. And finally, there's another case related to Trump's alleged interference with the 2020 election. This one a federal case, so it's at the U.S. government level, not the state level, while the other one is local to Georgia. And for this one, Trump was charged with conspiracy to defraud the U.S., conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding, the election and the peaceful changing of the guard at the government, basically, conspiracy against rights, and obstruction of and attempt to obstruct an official proceeding. Again, referring to the election and the mechanisms of handing over power from one administration to the next following an election. The basis of these allegations are that Trump and his people did all sorts of things to disrupt the 2020 election, including trying to coerce lawmakers into backing his efforts to remain in power as president, despite the election not having gone his way. These efforts culminated with the attack on the U.S. Capitol on January 6th by his supporters, and the case is predicated on the idea that while Trump was repeatedly told by his own people, experts on elections and everything about them, that he lost fair and square, he continued to insist that he was robbed, that the election was rigged, and so on. And that meant while he knew the election was not rigged, he acted as if he didn't, which means that he tried to illegally and intentionally mess with a core component of the U.S. democratic system, which is very much not allowed. Some of Trump's people were also indicted in this case. He was indicted on four counts himself, and the case is currently on hold while the Supreme Court makes a determination about whether his position as president at the time gives him full or partial immunity to legal consequences for actions that he takes while serving in that role. The idea being that maybe simply being president should give him some leeway, and maybe if it could be argued that he did what he did because he genuinely thought something was amiss with the election process, that would count as his acting as president for the good of the country, and that would make him immune to legal consequences for doing what he did because he did it as president, as part of his responsibility as president. Oral arguments before the Supreme Court in this case took place at the end of April 2024, and while we don't have a surefire timeline for a ruling in this case, at the time I'm recording this at least, it's expected that it will take long enough that the main federal case that is waiting on that Supreme Court judgment won't even begin, much less end, before the November election. At which point, some experts expect, at least if Trump wins, even courts finding him guilty won't matter because the federal stuff he could probably brush away using the powers of president, and the state stuff won't have the means to punish him because he will control enough levers of power at the federal level that it wouldn't be a fight the states could win. As I mentioned earlier, though, what I'd like to talk about today is the only court case Trump has been involved with since his presidency that has thus far come to a close, and what his being found guilty in that case might mean. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Learn more about Let's Know Things, subscribe to receive free email updates, and or become a supporter to receive monthly bonus episodes at letsknowthings.com. Back in October of 2016, a recording of then-presidential candidate Trump, in which Trump was heard telling the host of a show called Access Hollywood that if you're famous, you can get away with grabbing women's genitals without permission, was released to the public. This was after he became the Republican Party's official nominee in July of that year. And a few months before that recording was released, American Media Incorporated, the company behind the National Enquirer, made a deal with an adult film star who performed under the name Stormy Daniels to buy her story about an affair with Trump years earlier, agreeing to pay her $150,000 to feature her on a couple of magazine covers and to publish 100 articles written by her in their publications. This payout was part of a so-called catch-and-kill deal that AMI's CEO, David Pecker, made with the Trump campaign to basically keep its ear to the ground for any bad news that might pop up and make the candidate or campaign look bad, and then to step in and buy the rights to those stories, if possible, killing them, keeping them from going public, basically, because they would own the rights and then not do anything with them keeping them from messing with Trump's campaign. Trump's fixer, Michael Cohen, then arranged to buy the affair story from AMI for $130,000, a deal that included a non-disclosure agreement on Daniel's part, so she would not be able to tell the story 
to anyone else legally. But then in November of that same year, 2016, the Wall Street Journal received a tip that helped them uncover elements of that deal and thus the alleged affair. And that in turn led to a slow drip of new divulgences that trailed Trump through his presidency, though mostly at a pretty low rumor-like level. Cohen then tried to get reimbursed for paying out of pocket to buy the story from AMI. And the compensation for that purchase was put in the official books as a series of retainer fees, intentionally misrecorded in order to conceal the hush money payout in official business documents. The payout having been legal, but concealing such a payment in this way being against the law. In 2018, the journal was able to publicly report the details of Cohen's payout to Daniels, and in April of that year, federal agents raided Cohen's office and hotel room, which netted them documents that proved he made those payments and that they differed from those aforementioned official business records. Everyone involved was denying any of this happened and any connection of any kind to any kind of payout for a long time then. But in 2018, those same people started to change their stories, basically saying, yeah, okay, there was some kind of deal, but it wasn't a big thing. Don't worry about it. Nothing illegal happened. And during this period, Cohen pled guilty to campaign finance violations and other related charges for making these hush money payments. And he testified against Trump, saying that the then president told him to do it. Cohen was sentenced to three years in prison. Trump was not charged with anything, and these two formerly close-knit people became very publicly at odds following all of this. In August of 2019, about a year after that public breakup in the relationship between Trump and Cohen, the Trump organization was served a grand jury subpoena, as the government wanted more paperwork related to these seeming violations. And then, all of this kind of disappeared from the public radar until after the election, which Trump lost to Biden in 2020. In 2021, though, a new district attorney stepped into the role in Manhattan, Alvin Bragg, and he inherited this still ongoing but somewhat simmering at that point case from his predecessor. In January of 2023, he brought in a new grand jury to hear the evidence that had been collected on the matter up till that point, and that grand jury indicted Trump for falsifying the records his company kept related to these payments. The idea being that not only did he do an illegal business thing, but he did an illegal business thing in order to influence the outcome of an election. Because those payments were meant to keep an embarrassing thing that might keep him from becoming president from becoming publicly known. The trial officially began in April of 2024, gobbling up a lot of now presidential candidate Trump's time as he had to be in the courtroom most Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays for the duration, which kept him from being as active on the campaign trail as he might have otherwise been. And throughout, Trump was issued gag orders to keep him from publicly attacking witnesses, jurors, court staff, and other people involved in the trial, which was something he seemed fond of doing. The concern was that he would smear those involved in order to keep them silent or to sway them to his side or that Trump's followers might be motivated to do violence against these people, as seems to have been the case on January 6th. Trump violated that gag order 10 times, at which point the judge in the case said he would consider jail time as punishment, since the relatively minor fines for these violations did not seem to be having the intended effect, keeping Trump from bad-mouthing those involved in the press and online when not in the courtroom. Then on May 30th, 2024, Trump became the first former U.S. president to be convicted of a felony, and he was actually convicted of 34 of them when the jury decided he was guilty of all the charges that were brought against him in this case. Trump says the case was rigged and that there's a conspiracy by his enemies that made all of this happen. The judge set July 11th as the sentencing date, so that is when we will find out what the punishment will be, and that punishment could add up to as much as a couple of years in prison, but likely, because of all sorts of variables that are favorable to Trump, he will only face a fine or probation of some kind at worst, which would be embarrassing, but not terribly impactful on his re-election efforts. After that, Trump will have 30 days to file an appeal, 
which he has said he will do, and once that is filed, the case will move on to the New York Appellate Division, which will decide on the matter, and after that, the New York Court of Appeals can decide if it wants to get involved to hear an appeal as well. The Supreme Court could theoretically also get involved here, but they would need to find some aspect of the appeal that relates to federal law, or which directly connects to the Constitution, and most experts have said, despite the fact that Trump seems really badly to want to get the Supreme Court involved, at this point at least, that seems unlikely. Because of how much time the appeal process typically takes, it's also considered unlikely that this will be sorted out before November which lines up nicely with the approach that Trump's team has been taking overall to draw things out as long as possible in order to keep any definitive conclusions from arriving before votes are cast. So while appeals on cases like this one seldom result in an overturning of the verdict, that might be moot if Trump wins the election before the appeals process finishes up. Though the flip side of that is while he can claim that the case is still being appealed potentially for years while it works its way through the system, That also means he is officially a felon until that happens, which means he will almost certainly still be a felon in the eyes of the law when the votes are cast, though he will still be able to vote in the election because of how Florida, where he lives, law works in regard to convicts being allowed to vote, the case having been in New York, not in Florida. Now that said, this conviction landed like a bomb in the political world, with conservative news outlets generally aligning themselves with Trump's claim that this was a baseless case brought by liberal leaders meant to keep him from winning another election, though new polling data indicates that independents, who are considered to be vital for November's close-at-this-point election, are not thrilled about this outcome. 49% of them saying that they think Trump should drop out of the race now that he's been convicted, and 15% of Republicans apparently saying the same, though importantly, both of those numbers from these polls were conducted before this case, and a lot of those numbers were conducted on premises that were theoretical, so not this specific case, and these questions were not asked after Trump had been convicted. So there's a chance a lot of those people might change their minds based on the specifics or based on the fact that this is now reality as opposed to theory. The race is still largely tied up between Trump and Biden at this point, and it will be a while before we see any solid numbers about the impact this case might have on possible voters come November. It may be significant enough to make a difference, and it may be a flash in the pan sort of thing. It is hard to tell which way it will go at this point, and we do not have historical baselines for this, because this is the first time this has happened. There are concerns that Trump supporters might be nudged toward violent acts in the wake of this decision, and research from extremist watchdog groups have warned that some of them have already been attempting to dox, to get the personal information of, including addresses and family information, of the jurors and legal staff in the case, some of them calling for harassment campaigns and violence against these people as revenge for finding in the court as they did against Trump. And there's also data indicating that trust of government institutions on the U.S. right amongst Republicans might diminish even further than it already has, which does not tend to be a great trend for democracy and stability in countries where that sort of thing happens. President Biden's administration initially remained mum on this topic, though he eventually, through his campaign, said that the justice system worked, that it applies to everyone, and that the only way to keep Trump out of office again, because he can continue to run and win, even if he is a convict and even if he were put in jail, is to vote against him. And Trump said basically the same thing in reverse, that the only way to right this wrong that was done to him is to elect him again in November. And his campaign has said that they pulled in tens of millions of dollars in campaign contributions in the hours following this conviction. While this is being seen as a small victory in some circles and a massive injustice in others then, the main takeaway, at the moment at least, as of the day I'm recording this, is that the election in November is the only really truly vital decision here because the wheels of justice do move very slowly and strangely, and they do not line up terribly well with the time constraints inherent in democracies, and inherent in this specific type of situation. The book I'd like to recommend today is called The Final Empire by Brandon Sanderson. 
This is the first book in a fairly long series of books. I'm on book seven at this point, but the world in which this is set is interesting. It starts out as a sort of fantasy epic, a world in which people consume and then burn metal to achieve special powers, and they can use metals in other interesting ways in this universe as well. And it starts out in this fantasy world with a big epic story, but then that fantasy world becomes the history, several hundred years later, of a sort of turn of the 19th century steampunky electricity just being invented and deployed sort of world set in the exact same place, the same city, the same region. But all of those characters have fallen into folklore and myth. There's new characters, the same general rules, but expounding upon those rules. And then apparently, I haven't gotten there yet, after this book, it moves even further into the future into a kind of sci-fi world that's built on the same premise. Same world, same history, same background, same sorts of powers, but evolved still further into the future. These books are fun. They start out and continue along what I would consider to be like a hard fantasy world where there are powers and other fantastical elements, but these fantastical elements are based on a fairly well-developed rule system, so they're not just inventing them out of whole cloth in order to move the story forward. It's got fun characters, it's got interesting character development and storylines, the world itself is pretty interesting. And as I mentioned, there's quite a few books in this series. I'm on book seven, still enjoying it. If any of that sounds interesting to you, consider picking up a copy of the first book in that series, The Final Empire by Brandon Sanderson. You can subscribe to receive email updates, find show notes, and other such content, and support this show financially, receiving additional bonus episodes as a thank you at letsknowthings.com. Learn more about me and my work at colin.io. Subscribe to my other news-focused podcast, One Sentence News, wherever you get your pods, or at onesentencenews.com. And say howdy on social media. I'm at Colin is my name on Instagram and Twitter, and Colin Wright on Facebook and YouTube. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I'll talk to you again next week. Mm-hmm.